Hello. Eric. Hello. Thanks for coming. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, like I said, I've been watching your stuff forever. You, everyone says this is a golden age of TV. You formally kicked off the golden age of TV <laughs> back at HBO in, in the late 90s. Um, you guys all know this, but in case they don't, tell us, tell us what you brought to TV during your tenure at HBO. Well, I hired people who brought a bunch of shows to TV. I mean, in the, in the late 90s, we started with Oz and Sopranos, Sex and the City, Six Feet Under, Band of Brothers, uh, Entourage, uh, uh, Curb, um, Big Everything Love. great that's on television uh, comes from you. Yeah, Greenlit, True Blood before I left there, a lot of things. Lot so of now you're doing that at Stars. Now, now you're, yeah, now well, you want to it's a little it. different at Stars. You know, it's a, it's, it's a different time. I mean, I think what happened at HBO uh, in the late 90s was we created a space and an opportunity for creative people to look and say, wow, we can do television a different way. I mean, you know, television had been done basically one way for a really long time. And this was, although that was, there, there, was, there was an evolution there, this was a giant jump. So some time has passed. There are a lot more entries and, you know, the, the, uh, the formula at HBO was a good formula, but not a secret formula. So other people have, uh, emulated that. There's, this is the, the second golden age, the continuation of the golden age, whatever it is. So different time, a little bit different strategy for stars. So let's, let's talk about that. We'll, and we'll go back to some HBO stuff as well. But, but at stars, what are you doing that's sort of actively different than what you did at HBO? Obviously, the, the main idea is put on programs people want to see and hopefully subscribe to, to subscribe to the channel. But yeah. beyond that, what's different? Well, you know, uh, there are, uh, I, the field isn't exactly crowded, but there's a lot of people out there. So. At Stars, what we're really trying to do is instead of being everything to everyone, we're targeting a bunch of specific audiences that we think are underserved by a lot of the other entrants into particularly the subscription premium space um, and going after them at a very affordable price, either through our MVPD partners in, in what now seems to be the skinny bundles or in now you know, more effectively the OTT model through wholesale distributors like Amazon or our direct-to-consumer app. So let's talk about those audiences. Who are those underserved audiences? That you're well, African-Americans, uh, women, oddly enough, in the premium space, not on television, but in the premium space, aside from Sex and the City, which we did at HBO back then, there have been very few shows that have been actually targeted to say, you know what, this, this is a female demographic uh, f first and foremost. And you came to Stars how long ago? Seven years. Seven years. And was the idea from the get-go, I want to go after this audience, this is what I want to no, do? No, the idea from the get-go was, it was a, it was a very uh, business-oriented CEO job at first, because we were owned by Liberty Media, John Malone, two trackers of Liberty, the one tracker of Liberty, shut down a movie company, reabsorbed by Liberty, spun out by Liberty, with a for sale sign around her neck. So there's a lot of, a lot of you know, CEO dance steps to learn. Um, but, but this notion of saying there are underserved audiences in, in pay premium television, um, that's the market we want to go to. Was that always in your head, or did you end up there because that's where you found yourself you know, successful? Uh, whether, uh, you know, throughout my career, I've looked at talent and looked at opportunities, whether it be things we made for HBO or even before when we were make, uh, HBO making shows for other networks like Rock and Martin and, and shows like that for Fox. So um, the African-American audience in particular, they're voracious television users. They've over-indexed in the premium space, and yet, I thought they were underserved in terms of programs that were targeted to try and appeal to them more directly than, uh, than others. But you know, when you're running a, a company like Stars, especially today, what we're trying to do is just grow our business every day. You know, there are companies out there that are trying to own the world. We're trying to succeed in the world. So uh, this finding audiences that we can serve, especially now that we're accessible to them in a more affordable way. Later on uh, this year, hopefully in the first half of this year, we're going to start to offer prepaid cards to be able to buy uh, stars. You know, you know, the so stars how, how will that work? Well, we're still working on it, but much, you know, there are a lot of people out there that would like to have premium television uh, that, I, that's, that certainly can't afford it with the cable bundle. So like buying an iTunes card at Target or yeah. Walmart, I'll buy yeah. a stars card. Absolutely, prepaid card for people that don't have credit cards. And I'll buy a year's worth of stars? Still to be determined. That would be great. I mean, you know, one of the big obstacles in, in any subscription business is churn, whether it's magazines or, uh, or you know, television. So if you can sell people a longer subscription, that does help. But then obviously it's a bigger check uh, for them to get because even at a direct to consumer model, Stars is $8.99, which, right. is, which is inexpensive compared to HBO or So Showtime you think there's an audience that, that could and would pay for Stars or other subscription services like this, but don't have a credit card and you can convert them with cash, essentially? I think absolutely we can, yeah. Super interesting. And, and I'm always confused by this because, I mean, we've, anyone who's looked at pay TV forever knows that African Americans, for instance, over-index, um, but just broadly, the, there's always this 
theme almost yearly now where something will come out, like a couple years ago, it was Empire. Uh, last year was the NWA movie. This year it's Hidden Figures, and someone will say, oh, wow, there's this underserved market of African Americans, and if we make something that they like, they'll, they'll come out and support it. Um, how do we keep relearning this lesson but not really learning it? You know, I think it's the same with every minority demographic, although if you put all the minorities together, they become a majority. Welcome to America. But um, what, what, what's, what's happening even more than ever before is that there are groups that not only tend to gravitate towards television that speaks to them, but in social media, they tend to communicate about that. So the voracious users of social media, which happen to often be demographics, women, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, uh, you know, the LBGT audience, they are, they, they become the auxiliary marketing arm. So another big challenge in a world like today where there are a lot of offerings is to get your message out. And traditional media is one way, but not necessarily the most effective way to reach the people who you're trying to target with your programming. Um, and social media has become a, one of the key ways where, that people find out about content from their peers. Now, at least when I encounter your marketing out in the world, in, in the places I'm consuming marketing, I don't see messages from stars that say, stars for African Americans, or stars, it's a network you might like if you're a woman. Um, do you do more targeted, explicit advertising aimed at that demographic, those demographics, or is it just, here's programs, you might like them, you might Yeah, tell I don't your think people like to be told, this is for you, because that's a decision they'd like to make for themselves. And certainly with power, with shows like Outlander, Girlfriend Experience, uh, White Queen, there are broad audiences. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of men that watch Outlander because it's a great um, uh, time travel adventure yarn with, you know, with a great male hero. But the target audience is female, and then you kind of uh, you know expand out in concentric circles from that. And a lot of the shows then end up with I'll just keep going with geographic metaphors, Venn diagrams, you know, where where where, where different audiences um, overlap onto different shows. Um, so you started Stars seven or eight years ago. Uh, Netflix was streaming, but small. They were actually using Stars content as sort of the bulk. Unfortunately, yes. Watch your eyes roll all the way to the back of your head. Um, and then, but it was still the idea of streaming long form video to someone's home and having them consume it there was still a novelty. Um, the last four years, last few years, obviously it's accelerated. Last couple years, the idea that, that you would take premium television and sell it directly to the consumer went from will never happen to now it's a thing. So HBO's doing it, you're, you're, Showtime's doing it, you're doing it. How is selling direct to the consumer over the internet working for you? Well, it's working well. I mean, we're a little, we're, we're less than a year into it, you know, doing it directly. So it is a new business for us. We've traditionally been wholesale through the MVPDs. And um, the direct-to-consumer business is one that is lucrative in the sense that the split is better. Uh, we're, we're, so when you share money with an Amazon or an Apple, you or, get more of it than you do if you're selling it through Comcast. Yeah. And... Um, but also we have to market it there. We're, we're with an MVPD partner or even with Amazon. We're co-marketing or they're marketing or we're kind of sitting on their uh, you, you know, very large uh, subscriber base where they're selling a lot of products in and are marketing to that audience constantly. Um, the nice thing about the direct-to-consumer model aside from uh, the, you know, the economics is that the information that we get back from them is very valuable in terms of helping us decide where to spend our money, what direction to go, how to... Uh, uh, you know, frame our marketing because when we wholesale through the MVPDs, we don't really get. You have no connection to that consumer. Yeah, we don't really get a lot of consumer marketing. That's their customer, and they're very reluctant to share that. So uh, the, the, the closer that we get to the consumer, the better relationship that we can have, and the better that we can serve them. What have you guys said in terms of number of subscribers? A million. A million. I think Showtime and HBO, CBS have each said a million, and HBO Yeah, and yeah we started a little bit later than those guys. We're the only ones right now that have the download capability. And uh, aside from, I think, in a couple of places, we're, 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 we're certainly the lowest price. In some places, uh, um, Showtime is $8.99 as well. But I, I don't want to gloss over the, the download. That's a, again, just to spell it out, you, I can take one of your shows. I can take power and put it on my phone, take it on my tablet, right. get on the plane and watch yeah, it. Yep. Um, this is the kind of thing that, that people like me um, are always asking for. Um, and people like HBO and Netflix say, and no one really wants it. Uh, Netflix is starting to do it. Uh, Amazon has done it. Why haven't people done it up until really this, this year? Uh, you know, I think it's something that was an afterthought. I mean, a lot of people, you have, you have to go back and get the rights to do that because most people didn't 
uh, you know, who are licensing content from other studios, be it television or studios, be it film independent, are not licensing those rights. Um, luckily for us, we were able to, you know, we, we had most of those rights, and so we were able to stand back, look at what the other services were doing in terms of how they uh, developed the technology for their platform, their, their, their direct consumer platform, and say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves aside from what's on. It's just, you know, the, uh, the features that, that make it valuable. So you said you've been able to learn by selling this stuff directly, learn what, through what people are watching and signing up for the, over a year. You've got a year or so of data. How is that manifesting itself in terms of either what you're making or how you're marketing it? What, what changes have you made? You know, for 17, I think that what we l really learned in 16, in, the, in those first months, is you need to have a message out there. And it's not a message out there necessarily marketing, it's a programming message out there. So for 17, we're uh, premiering more titles in 17 on the original programming side than we ever have before. And That's because of what you've learned from your consumer? Yeah. How, how does that manifest? How, how do you Well, I, you know, look, there, there, there are two real sort of big buckets in, in direct to consumer. One is acquiring the subscriber and the other is retaining the subscriber. Both of, of, of those are better served by having a message around a new title because what it does is it allows you to market uh, you know, to something specifically and it also brings the, and then, and then when you bring the subscriber in, you're giving them a lot of choice. I mean, we have more movies than HBO or Showtime uh, between our output deals and our library deals. So when they come in, there's a ton of content for them to, to uh, take a look at. And if, if they've come in for a particular show and then four weeks later there's another message for another show, then th the idea that they're gonna think before they disconnect, because although it's easy to sign up when you are selling direct to the consumer, it's also easy to disconnect. So the, the new shows bring them in, the new shows help keep them um, next title. So there's a show that might keep them in. Then the next titles and and the, and the library, both of the originals and the films, helps 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 to keep them and to reduce churn. Because HBO has said pretty consistently, the, the bulk of our consumption, even though we talk about Girls or Curb, is is people watching Fast and Furious one through seven or whatever they're showing on HBO. Does that still hold true for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of a function of if you've got, you know, that. 75% of the number of hours that, you're, that, that you have available, either on your on-demand platform, whether it be streaming or through your uh, cable provider or just on your linear platforms, are films. I mean, they're two hours long, you have a big library, and the originals tend to be, while more impactful uh, on your business in terms of helping define your brand and, and, and you know, growing your business, uh, they are less in terms of the number of hours. So I think that's kind of a math exercise rather than a, what's important to the consumer exercise. And, and if you had to grow new muscles, I don't like that metaphor, but um, if you had to learn new skills in terms of direct to consumer, this is not something you were doing a year yeah, ago. We'll still, yeah, now. we're still learning those skills. Um, and you know, Jeff Hirsch, who's the CEO of Stars now, came over to us a little from over a year Warner ago. From Time Warner Cable, right? From Time Warner Cable, who's the CMO. So uh, between Allison Hoffman, who is uh, our, our, our Stars marketing person, Theano, who's, who, who's here now, who's our press person, you know, we're learning how to get those messages out there and working with the big social media platforms, which we were starting to do just on, on the traditional stars business, but now working with them on the OTT and direct-to-consumer business, those two things are, are, are really going more hand-in-hand, -hand. but it's definitely a learning process and I'm sure it will be as long as we're in it. So we talked about this new golden age and so there's you guys and Showtime and HBO and now Netflix and now Amazon, Amazon. and Crackle and Verizon and, and so much more noise in the marketplace. So beyond having a targeted message, how do you think about sort of finding someone who either doesn't know what Stars is or has heard of you but not really familiar with what you do and getting them to give you their eight or nine or ten bucks instead of spending it on HBO? You know, I think it has a lot to do with targeting those audiences. I mean, if you look at the demographic of the star subscriber, now this is partly a function of some things that we have on the air, but I think it creates an opportunity for us. They are uh, more uh, heavily weighted to African Americans, more heavily weighted to women, um, and more heavily weighted to household income less than $50,000 a year. That's not your traditional premium television audience. Why do you think, by the way, H I mean, everyone wants to grow their market. HBO is spending a ton of time trying to, why do you think HBO or Showtime or anyone else would seed that market? They can all look at the same reports you're looking at. Well, I think it was really hard to reach that market for a long time because you were, you know, the MVPD, if the, the buy through the stack, I mean, you're at $100 plus before you're even able to buy premium. The two biggest opt 
the, the two biggest obstacles to there being a broader penetration of premium television have historically been content objectors who don't even want the uncut theatricals in their home and price. Wait, a content objector is someone in the house who doesn't want that TV? Yeah, people who don't want premium television in their home because they don't want the films, they don't want the original programming, they, you know, they don't want it. They don't, no, Not no buying. matter how many parental controls you might have. They don't oh, oh, oh because they don't want a naked person or violence or both. Anything, yeah. But exactly. The, but Naked, violent people they don't want in their house, which I think is probably a good, is a good rule for everybody. But, it's a lot of TV. Um, yeah. Um, so they didn't want that, so you, and you're not trying to solve that problem. You're going to deliver We're not trying naked, to solve the naked, naked, violent people You're going to deliver more of that. Yeah. Uh, but what you can do is say, instead of having to get $100 worth of cable and then yeah, buy here it stars. Is, and I know, yeah, I mean, you need, and, and the truth is, while you could use it over Wi-Fi, I mean, you know, I have the stars app right here on my phone, and when you've got a good, you know, mobile connection, you can stream anything, and, and uh, you can watch it anywhere. So. It, 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 it's, it's also kind of counterintuitive to, what, to how, many, how much money is going into originals and how much money certain people are spending on these giant productions. You know, people aren't watching more television on larger and larger screens. People are watching more television on smaller and smaller screens. And so the writing, the stories, um, you know, the, the performances, I think become more important because television is becoming more personal in a way. So, uh, so the... The idea that there's an audience out there that would like to access premiums, but doesn't have the discretionary income to do it in the traditional model, even in the skinny bundle model, can now access some of their favorite, hopefully stars, services, platforms through this uh, you know, direct-to-consumer app. You alluded to this, this sort of arms race and spending. Um, again, there's more people in the market, there's more competition, and also you're just seeing as sort of a marketing point, right? Netflix says the crown cost $100 million, and that sort of in and of itself was supposed to be a reason to watch it. Um, are you a willing or unwilling participant in this arms race, or do you say, no, we're, we're it sounds like you're saying we're, we're going to actually actively not spend so much money? I, 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 we're not in, you know, as I said, we're not in it to own the world. The crown is a fine show. I looked at the script beforehand. Uh, it, it, saying it's a show you chose not to, to make. Well, I, I don't think we could have competed. You know, I mean, it, it's not, we're, we're not going to, we don't need to do that. So you, you, you we're, couldn't spend $100 million on well, that? Well, we could spend $100 million. We have $100 million, but I don't think that that's the best choice for us because I think in order to grow our business, I mean, look, we're still part of a public company, which is Lionsgate. With our partnership with Lionsgate now, we have the ability to access talent uh, a little bit more effectively, both in terms of the touch points that we have, in terms of what we can offer talent on the deal-making process, uh, what we can offer talent if something's successful in terms of monetizing ancillary rights. Uh, so, and, and so um, while talent certainly wants to make money, I don't know that it's how much the show costs I think it's how true can you help them be to their vision? How, how much can you support them? And then in success, how uh, you know, profitable can you make it for them? And I think we can do all of those things without spending $100 million on a show. So we're talking about Netflix. Earlier we talked about how Netflix launched their business through the Stars distribution deal. Yeah, well, they launched their business through you know, uh, mailing DVDs. Right. And then Stars made a really ill-advised deal before I got there. Uh, which almost which almost broke the company and and did way basically more than gave them access to Sony and Disney's movies for yeah, release and all the fee. yeah all the stars oh, yeah library content everything really so you get there and deal. is it clear to you and everyone else that, that deal has to stop or was that there was an ongoing discussion about maybe Netflix yeah the, the deal, deal the, you know what what uh, and this isn't this isn't talking out of school look those those guys are they're, first of all their friends Reed and Ted and they've done an unbelievable job uh, their team is terrific uh, and they have a great business model. What was apparent to me was the deal couldn't continue under the same terms. We had a target on the back for the MVPDs. Uh, it was doing a better job for them than for us. What we said to them was, we'll continue, much like what we have with Amazon now, we'll continue to do this with you, but we need to be in a higher tier. This can't be you know, all you can eat. For, once they were- you Can't sell this for 10 bucks. It's I think it was 7 99 at that point. You know, once you're all you can eat for 7 99 that's the buffet, and we're you know, we're uh, prime or filet mignon, whatever analogy you want to use. So that's a, you know, that, that has to be an upsell. They, they weren't interested in that architecture. Who could argue? So it wasn't just the decision. straight amount of money they needed to pay. They could have actually, no. I mean, it, 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 we, we were willing to continue with them. We just needed to have the same kind of placement. To protect your to core protect, business. And to protect our core business, protect, uh, you know, the relationship and the conversations that we have with the long-term MVPD partners who still provide the bulk, the vast majority of, 
um, the revenue to stars. So how does that work now? So when you go out and you sell direct to a consumer, and so you are now competing with the Comcast and time. I don't think we're really competing because as we said before, their audience is that they're not really going after. Right, you tell them that and HBO says this. So we're not, we're not competing. This is all going to be good for you, the traditional cable guys. But their reaction seems to be generally, um, we don't really like that you're now competing with us. Yeah, you know, look, they don't like anything. You know, so um, they just don't like programmers. And there's probably some good reasons why they don't like programmers. And there's good reasons why programmers, you know, tend to be wary of the MPPDs. Um, they sell broadband. That's probably their highest margin product. So ours might be one of their highest margin video products, but broadband's probably their highest margin product. So the more that people are using the wireless, the broadband, right. you know, uh, mobile in the case of AT&T, although there's some, uh, you know, there's some concerns that we have over there with uh, their intended, you know, purchase of Time Warner, but um, the, uh, the idea that Stars is available to consumers isn't really cannibalizing their business. Where it tends to get tricky is if they would try to restrict the price that we could sell for. Because I think what we've shown is, guys, if you price it, more people will come. If you price it, uh, attractively, you have a wholesale relationship. More people will come. Yeah, and and they could price Stars more attractively. You know, they don't. But they could, and still make a lot of money on stars. So it's part of they what you're doing. They probably could do that with HBO, and they probably could do that to a lesser extent with with um, Showtime. HBO has been out in the marketplace for a long time, made a lot of money by raising their wholesale rate, and you know, uh, with 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 stars, kind of the good news, bad news has been that we're a cheaper product for them. Therefore, they can afford to price us more inexpensively when 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 they sell to the what are you, What are your concerns about the AT&T Time Warner deal? Well, no, I mean, they're our largest customer. They, they might end up becoming also our largest competitor, so. Um, you know, I'm sorry. They're our largest customer, AT&T, AT &T is. Yeah, DirecTV, so. And, and they become your biggest competitor. And so what's the practical effect, do you think? Because it oh, seems like. Oh, I don't like know. Anyway, it's too, too, uh, too, too early to tell. Right, but I keep asking them, like, I don't understand the logic. Of, I don't get what AT&T gets out of buying Time Warner because they still have to offer HBO to all the other competitors, the same terms. And That'd be a question for a regulator. John and, oh no, John Stanky and Randall, and Randall Stevenson. We'll ask them at some point. Yeah, next time they're here. Um, you guys did a deal with Spotify a couple months we ago. We did, yeah. You, you guys were all excited about it, and I, was, I have to admit that I'm a little confused about why that's an exciting deal. Well, I... <laughs> Uh, I'm giving you a softball, so you can Yeah, you know, I think we're, that, that's, that's the beginning of what we hope to be a deepening. Why don't we tell people what it is in case they haven't seen it? it would, well, there's a, there's a, uh, a music feed on, uh, that, 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 that's now available. So, so you, can, you can now have Spotify on your Stars app and vice versa. Uh, but we hope that it's, that it's a, you know, a deepening relationship with Spotify because all of these potential partners for Stars and for selling Stars are... Um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of the wild west out there. So the more people that want to sell stars, the more people that want to advertise stars uh, to, to their customers or be part of our platform, uh, the more potential we have to not only access consumers, but to keep them in a... So right now it's sort of marketing, right? Like you can universe. watch an episode of Power, then you can get yeah. the playlist and go over to the Spotify app. At some point, do you imagine that you sort of become an entertainment hub, and so I'm consuming my Spotify and my stars from the same place? You know, we have an idea around, uh, a kind of federation idea around the stars app. I mean, again, it's very early days, so we're learning as we go, but uh, if we put out a few tentacles in different directions, it's, it's not... Uh, so you become your you become a bundler again, like Ben Thomas was talking yeah, about. Yeah, not necessarily a wholesale bundler, but a but a, but I think your your word of a hub is 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 a good word. Was that your word or my word? Well, you can have credit for it. Okay, hub. Um, you, you gave me curb your enthusiasm. You can do whatever you want. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, marketers. How big a role is Amazon play in, in you selling to? Uh, They've done a great job with with uh, stars, um, and they're amazing retailers. Obviously, uh, the product that they I think have the most focus on has traditionally been Amazon Prime, which which is a great product. Uh, it's something that's delivered to my house every day. Uh, that comes from Amazon Prime. Uh, they're they're investing a lot in the video business, and they and they seem to like it. But what they have been is selling stars. They have it on, you know, they, they have it on their rack of video products. Um, they've been marketing it. It's different than our app because we send them MES files, so it's uh, an environment that's curated by them with the stars product. But uh, it's 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 done well, and 
Um, we hope that not, not only will that relationship continue and they'll invest more in, in broadening uh, the number of subscribers or increasing the number of subscribers that they have, but that companies look at that and say, hey, we can you know, start a business where we can make money by selling this terrific product um, and wholesaling and it, it doesn't it doesn't interfere with our business, but it could augment or go hand in hand. I've, with I've it. talked to some programmers who said uh, Amazon is getting close to close to fifty percent of their subscriptions are coming through Amazon. Is that, is that That's not us. Not I mean, for you. We, no, not that big. No. Okay. I have more questions, but I want to open it up to you folks in the audience. Interesting yeah. light. Yeah. Here you go. It's a dramatic. Oh, I, I knew this guy would have a question for you. <laughs> hey, Lucas. Hey, uh, hey Chris. Um, you guys were acquired by Lionsgate fairly recently. I'm wondering, Lionsgate produces a bunch of television. Will that enable you to increase the amount of original programming that you put on stars as you see all of your competitors seem to be doing so? And whether or not you increase the amount of programming that you release, how do you approach marketing and standing out besides making deals with someone like Amazon at this moment where it seems like Netflix can get attention for, you know, I don't know, staging a protest or doing just about anything, and everybody else has a much harder time getting buzz around a particular show or project. So, uh, you know, the Lionsgate TV studio is a great producer of content. Ours is the new black. Uh, you know, they did Mad Men. Uh, they have a long, a long list of shows that are on now. They have a lot of hours of television. So they'll see more things. We'll have more looks. They're certainly a partner. That, um, that we can use. We, we want to retain more rights. So the, the, the Lionsgate television distribution apparatus, I think, can do a much better job of monetizing the rights that we retain than stars could as a standalone with a smaller library. Um, but with regard to marketing, you know, there, look, I, I, while I think you can name a bunch of shows that are on Netflix, there's probably a lot more shows that are on Netflix that you can't name. So they're in, a, they're in a different business than we are. We've had, we've had more shows on every year uh, over the last few years, and we look for that to continue. So this relationship with Lionsgate isn't in itself a function of, well, now that there's Lionsgate TV, so there'll be more sh shows on stars. I think we'll look to invest um, more money because the net investment can be uh, much more um, conservative than the gross investment given the, 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 you know, the ability to monetize it. And in terms of how we market, like I said, you know, there, there are shows that we go out and do a traditional marketing campaign, and there are shows that we do a much more digital-based marketing campaign, which can be more targeted um, and more cost-effective, maybe not as talent-friendly, because you know, talent, especially in New York and LA, likes to see their, their shows on tall walls or side of buses. Still, or, still want that billboard well, on Sunset I, I, Boulevard. Yeah. I think. I mean, I think, it, I think more than anything, they want to be successful, but I think that's still a, um, you know, somewhat of a mark of the networks behind you. When, you. when you were at HBO in that first big successful run, the, 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 there was TV and there were movies, and movie stars didn't come to TV or they came over in sort of very particular circumstances. And now that wall seems to have gone down, and now the, the cliche is that uh, TV is the new movies and you can do projects you can't do elsewhere. Um, would you program? Would you program differently in that '90s run if you had access to, to that t different pool of talent, or would you have done what you did? Um, you know, it's a hard question to answer. I think that the idea of movie stars coming to television sure has something to do with what's available on television, but also has a lot to do with the fact that you're just not making as, ma as many movies or certain kinds of movies, and, and you know, who is a bankable movie star now? Uh, look, talent is. Definitely one way to cut through the marketing clutter if you've got a big name, uh, but it's not the only way. And if the show's not good, then certainly talent doesn't. Right, people didn't success. watch True Detective because Matthew McConaughey was in it. They watched it because it was an exciting show. Yeah, I mean, I think True Detective it, it didn't even premiere that amazingly. It's just that the reviews were fantastic, the performances were great, uh, and I think the show built over over a period of time. But without Matthew McConaughey, uh, without Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. Uh, you know, the second version of that show didn't do as well, and I, you know, even though they had uh, some movie names yep. attached to it. So it's not just who's in it, but it's a lot more about what is it. Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Rapp. Uh, your career is in, in picking shows. What, uh, you know, it, based on your assessment of the potential success of it, and today we have so much data from social media. I'm curious, what are the inputs that 
you rely on when you're deciding what you know you think is going to be good or not and you know do you look at social media feeds today to find out what people are interested in uh, feedback on talent uh, what are some of the inputs you use when you make you know I, look I try and use as many inputs that are available to me it's still not I, I don't think there's a formula or an equation for a television show or a film or a song or something it's still uh, you know you you, ha you have to back some real creative talent's vision of something and help them execute it. Uh, but I talk to, to the younger people in the audience, and I mean in the audience, in the office, and ask them what they're watching. Uh, we just had a meeting the other day, where we, uh, maybe it was yesterday, where we were talking about two different uh, projects that might have appealed to the same audience. We probably weren't going to do both of them, didn't necessarily mean we needed to do either of them, but we had a pretty good discussion. Ultimately, I think you know, for me, it's still, I'm going to read something, I'm going to look at what resources we have and look at what else we have on, I'm going to see where I think the need for stars might be, what the opportunity for stars might be, and then I'm going to try and use my gut feeling. I, I, it's, it's, I think no one can predict what will work. I think I have a pretty good sense of what won't work, at least on stars. So if I can start there and then, you know, eliminate the things that I believe won't work and look at the things that I don't know, then you try to pick the best one that suits whatever you think uh, the need or opportunity. So there's still room for your gut in this business. I think there has to be because yeah. it's not it's 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 not science, um, it's magic. Last question. Uh, we've seen recently HBO and Showtime, um, especially HBO, get more in the news commentary space. Showtime in the sports space as well. Uh, is that an area that stars would go in? And if not, why not? Uh, I don't think sports. You know, what, we had this problem at HBO too. It's like what sports are left that you could actually. You know, all the big sports are taken. Boxing is, you know, kind of a mess. You know, has been for a while. MMA is kind of taken, and and you know, pay-per-view. The economics are so much better than just selling a show for a license fee, um, and it would be too expensive for most people to buy a one-time big event. So, but with news, uh, news, you know, broadly speaking, I mean, I put on the, you know, Dennis's show. Uh, I put on Bill the the. the the Dennis Miller Show. I put on Bill's show. I don't know if you consider those new shows. I know they had their relationship with Vice, um, which I think has done a lot for Vice. I'm not sure how much it's done for HBO. Maybe it's done great for HBO. I'm not saying it hasn't. So we're thinking about that area. We, we've, we've got a, we've got a, a some, something little that, uh, that, that we're going to try. I'm not convinced that makes a big difference. I'm not convinced that people buy stars and use stars f for that kind of when's, programming. When's the stars news ex uh, experiment coming out? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's actually going to be coming up in my office watching it before uh, we decide whether anybody else gets a chance to see it. All right, we'll ask you about it backstage. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Peter. Thanks. Thanks for coming.